Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and I'd like to welcome you to Current. I hope you're ready to be refreshed, renewed and empowered. The ladies and I have a wonderful program lined up for you today. We're going to be talking about the church, that's all of us, and how the church is looking and what it's looking like in today's culture. In fact, are we living in exile? And if so, what does that even mean? Are we succumbing to the culture or are we setting ourselves apart to live holy lives? It's not an easy discussion to have because unfortunately, if we really examine what society looks like today, what is acceptable, what is perceived as right and okay, then we'll probably see ourselves honestly as moving away from lives that are pleasing to God. But let's see what the current ladies have to say about our culture. Are we the church living in exile? Welcome, ladies. It's Good a question. Deep subject, deep really. subject <laughs> right? So I was so I was sitting down to do research on this topic and from when we got our list of topics a while back, I um, did not correlate at all what what the church in exile was to what it actually means. Did y'all feel that way too? Yes. You said totally. that? yes. <laughs> I just thought, is the church not fit with today's culture? But really, when I started reading and learning about what exile is, and there's example after example of people in the Bible who went into exile, <clears throat> exile is being banished or banned from your former home, but living in community and living in harmony with your new surroundings, right? with your new country, or what, in, you know, in the case of the Bible. And that was surprising to me. And so I looked at this whole topic through, through a different lens because of that. So have mm -hmm. we been banished? Do you think we've been banished from our, our culture? Well, I, I don't necessarily look at it that way. I, I think that the main point that I look at is how am I supposed to spread light and goodness right. and Christ's love? in my life, in my community, in my church, mm -hmm. to people around me. I don't necessarily think that, I don't know that I want to focus on culture wars. I think, I think sometimes it gets dangerous if we focus on culture wars. I think instead we need to focus on what are we called to do? How are we called to serve? Mm -hmm. And what does that look like right now? Mm -hmm. That's a good mm -hmm. step. You know, it's funny because I, I, this was really challenging in yeah. my own spiritual walk. So I always thank you that you make us dive so deep. I mean, this is like, wow, this is good. Because you do a lot of research, and there is so many theologians who come at different aspects of this. And I think the scripture that really hit me really hard yesterday was um, 1 Peter 2.12, when it says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers mm -hmm. in this world to abstain from sinful desires. Mm -hmm. And I think what hit me so hard was that you know that song, all I know is I'm not home yet, this mm -hmm. is not. And I thought, that's what that song's talking about. It's, it's deeper than what I've ever thought about it. This isn't our home. We are all foreigners in this land. And one guy I read yesterday said it so beautifully. He said, it's like your soul. It's inside your body, but it's not home. Yeah. There's a place that's deeper. And so I think for me, you know, this isn't our land, but it's to come together as a community and encourage each other to live a life that's pleasing to Christ. Because he goes on to talk about that in that scripture. It's just making sure that we're not becoming pleasers of this world, but becoming pleasers of God, you know? So I think we live in a culture that lacks authenticity and it's what we desire most. You know, social media is something that we have in our hands. Even five years ago, 10 years ago, we didn't have a phone, you know, at our, at our pocket, in our pocketbook, right. you know, in our, in, now everybody wears it in their jeans in the back. $700 phone, I don't understand that. Um, <laughs> but now the information is just, it travels so fast and it's not accurate, you know? And so it's, how many likes do we have? Oh, guess what? This picture got me 300 likes or 3,000 likes or 30,000 likes. But really, truly, I think what we desperately need is truth. We need love because that's more important. Yeah, I can give you the truth, but if I'm smashing it in your face, that's not okay. We spend about three hours at church on Sunday, unless you have multiple you know, services. So we're really out in exile Monday through Saturday, period. Unless you're Seventh-day Adventist or you're Catholic or you have some other services. That's it. So what are we saying and who are we talking to? You know, who's our audience? I know I have a secular business. I know you have a business that, that caters to everybody. They, everybody here has a business that really caters to everyone. We're not sitting here saying, if you're not a Christian, you can't come in. But what are we saying when you do come in? 
what are we doing when you come in? Are we talking about people behind their backs? Mm -hmm. Are we, you know, stabbing the next person and saying, oh, that woman that just left was da 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 da, versus saying, what's your day like? How are you? People don't know I'm a Christian unless they're on my Facebook. You know, not because I'm waving the Bible in their face and saying, let me tell you what the Lord has said today. Mm -hmm. I'm just loving on them. And my kids are loving on them. And we're being, actually, matter of fact, today on the, on the car ride home to, to school, my son was so upset because another little boy was saying that he was lying. And he goes, Mommy, I wasn't lying. And I said, Honey, understanding that your identity is found in Christ, but his word says, thou shalt not lie. I said, so take the pressure off of yourself. And instead of saying, you need to believe what I'm saying, tell him, you know what? I'm sorry that you don't believe me, but I'm telling the truth. I love you anyway. Have an awesome day and go play somewhere else. And he's like, oh, okay. And I looked at Kyla. I said, right, Kyla, don't we talk about that? She goes, yep, we sure do. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> So it's just little little tidbits of that. I think we take this pressure off and, oh, our world is going to hell. Look what's happening here. Well, man, that's what the devil wants you to believe. We've read the end of the story. We know that we win in the end. We know that God wins in the end. But what are we doing in our market ministries every day that we're walking to Sam's or Costco or in the car line or this or that? Are we breeding God's truth and his light? Are people just attracted to us by that versus what we say? What do you always say about we will be the only Bible people will ever read. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. They won't open the Bible. No. They're just watching us because when you say you're a Christian or people know, I mean, it's almost impossible, Barbara, for you to go someplace right. and people not know who you are. I have that same issue. And so when you're out and about, people are watching you and they are checking you out to see yeah. what you're doing yeah. and not just what you're doing, but how you respond in certain situations. We've had those conversations. Mm -hmm. But you know what, David Swanson is a deep fella. He really is. <laughs> he is you. always coming up with something that just kind of pushes you to really, really think. Right. I mean, he. sometimes I can't read his stuff because he's so deep, right? This one really, like you, Kristen, I was kind of like, not sure what direction mm -hmm. I was supposed to go with this. But I was having a conversation with my daughter and I was saying to her, you know, I do feel like I'm in a foreign land because there are things that are okay for other people that are just not okay for me. Mm -hmm. Even in terms of the way I dress and places I can go, things I can eat and be okay with it. There, and when you're like that, it's like, okay, God, why is it that it's okay for all of these other people, but it's not okay for me? I think that goes back to authenticity mm -hmm. in terms of who God called <laughs> us to be in this world yeah. where everything is okay. Mm -hmm. If it feels good, do it. That's what the culture and the society says today. And we're living in a time when people will take the word of God and twist it yeah. to justify That's right. what they're doing. And yeah. it's not right based on the word. And they want us to stamp it as okay. Yeah. And so... I think we are living in a very interesting time as believers where we may not be in people's faces saying that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. But the love that we show them in spite of yeah. opens the door and gives us an opportunity to really be who God called us to be. See, I think at one point in it, when maybe even back 50, 60 years ago, you could say, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Because the culture said that you that was the norm. That. Absolutely. Right. Today, the culture is a little more confusing and a little less uh, black and white, if right. you will, that our culture now is saying certain things look like they're okay. Mm -hmm. They didn't. So, so we're not effective as Christians if we come down hard on people. We have to change the way we respond yeah. to the sin. And it's not well, our job anyway. Well, the Bible right. says in Matthew 5, 13, 16, I love this, that we are to be salt and light. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really powerful. I'm so glad that you brought that up because it's yeah. one thing that, I mean, I've talked about it. We're really trying to pour into our children, first of all, some apologetics of why we believe what we believe. Don't just believe because mommy says so. We need to know the facts. We need to go back into the history of the world. There, mm -hmm. there is so many things that prove the the reality of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's it's true. it's just awesome, you know. But I think the biggest thing for me is just in a world they call it Christendom. Yeah. I was. Did you mm -hmm. look that yeah. up back then? It's mm -hmm. where. But we are living in a society. I'm so glad you bring that up about culture war. We can either take it. Oh, we're at war with them. I choose not to go at it. Sort of with that. 
outlook because I'm going to live my life. It's what I tell people all the time because it works. Whether you believe in Jesus Christ or don't believe, the laws that he puts through that Bible yeah. breathe life. You go look at people who try it the world's way. Just go back and look at their life. The Bible says there's joy in sin for a season, mm -hmm. but then you reap something that's not good. You go look at your life. Even in my own life, I can look back at times when I was following God's word and his ways. And then when I went off on my own way and where it led me. And so I think it's coming back that the world wants to call it a culture where we just got to live a life that people want what we have. Right. And it's not to be judgmental. I tell people all the time, listen, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not your judge, but I love you. God loves you. But man, if that way stops working for you, yeah. Come on back and try mine. Because we've got to look attractive to people too. God right. told the yeah. Israelites in the Bible, he said, when I send you into exile, you are to flourish. You're yes. to look good. You're to be attractive and winsome. These are not his yeah. words. These are my yeah. words. But he told them in that state of exile that they were supposed to continue to flourish. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're called to be. Yeah, we're in exile to a certain mm -hmm. extent because we are not the majority in our country. We are not, the, Christendom does not exist in the United States. Like at one time it probably did. But what's scary for me is it's even sometimes even in our Christian walk. I mean, I can't tell you how many Christians that I speak to and they don't see that having um, sex before marriage yeah. is no, really true. wrong anymore. That's I mean, true. there is so many things and oh, it's so awesome just to be able to share with them, you know, God's word and how it worked in my own life. That's why it's so important that we live mm -hmm. what we preach because people are watching us. What is that old statement that, um, that people are watching us more than what we preach, it's how we live. Right. And it's so important. I tell people, you need to be in the word because don't look at us, we will fail you, but God's word will never mm -hmm. fail you. Mm -hmm. But like she says all the time, they are watching us. Mm -hmm. And it's so important, right? This is, so in, in doing some of the study on this, this is what I found so interesting. You talked about Jeremiah, but um, so this particular quote says, instead the church would be better served to look at the words of Jeremiah, the prophet who spoke during the time of the Babylonian exile. Jeremiah challenged the Jews who had been taken into exile to withstand the desire to return to a restored Israel. Mm. He urged them to accept their new situation as the will of God and to seek God's blessing, God God's blessing on those they perceived as their enemies. Jeremiah called on them to seek the welfare of the city where God had sent them into exile, mm -hmm. which I think gives us like a very biblical take on something so historical, but that God challenged them not to desire to return to a restored Israel. He didn't want them moving backwards. Mm -hmm. He urged them to accept their new mm -hmm. situation as the will of God and to seek God's blessing on those they perceived as their enemies, the ones whose land and whom they lived. And finally, he called on them, Jeremiah called on them to seek the welfare of the city that God, to seek the good of the city that God had called them to. And I think so we can good. so take those words and apply them to where we are each individually right now, to seek the good of the place where we live now, to see the people who live around us, not as enemies, but that we want God's blessing heaped mm -hmm. upon them and not to desire to return to the past, but move forward into light and where God has called us now. I the visual it. that I got while you guys were talking is, it's like planting a seed and watering it, tending to it, fertilizing it, and then getting frustrated and yelling at it because it's not growing. You know, it's like, and then as it starts growing, you're like, why aren't you growing? I poured into you. I fertilized you. I watered you. I told you the truth. Well, that, that plant, that seed is not in, in your control to grow. You're mm -hmm. supposed to speak truth to it. You're supposed to love on it. You're supposed to, you know, uh, fertilize it. Mm -hmm. And then at the proper time, it will break and it will start growing. There's something so powerful what she said, though, because when I went through a real tough time in my life, and I remember one night in my prayer room, it was like 4 o'clock, and I was saying, God, I know if you just spoke or did something, you know, I'm waving the white flag that you could change everything. And I heard the Holy Spirit in my heart just plant a little seed that said, Carolyn, remember Moses? He said, I told him when they were grumbling and complaining, he said, I told them, move forward. And he said, I'm telling you to move forward because I'm not in your past. Mm -hmm. I am in your future. And when you said that right there, one thing that hit me real hard is that why he was telling him is he didn't want him to go into self-pity. It's so easy for us to just want to give up and go into defeat and, oh, woe is me and life is so bad and you didn't treat mm -hmm. me good. God says, get up. 
-hmm. Get up and stand up and stand in my power knowing that I'm the one that brought you here. Mm -hmm. And I'm the one that's going to bring you out. And it, that's really what it's about. It's a faith walk. It's really knowing who he is that God will sustain us through. But, it, but it's know. a diff difficult place, I think, to be also, if we're really being honest about it, to be in exile. It's not an easy place to be. And so sometimes when we're trying to look good mm -hmm. and have people accept us and to be tolerant of all this junk that's going on out there, right. Are we compromising our principles? Are we kind of taking a step back when, like you said, Carol, we continue to need to be strong? I mean, how can we be strong and stick to our principles, biblical principles, without compromising them? We love fearlessly. Exactly. Like we, we look at everything like never loved before. through a view of love. Yeah. I think. But I think also, I hear what you're saying. You're talking more than about love. You're talking about living out our beliefs because I think but I don't, I don't think our what, values. I don't, I don't think what anybody else does can change me living out my values. That's good. And I live out my values in the face of what everybody else is, is doing. Maybe and, you do, right. but not everybody does. Well, but they, they're living out their faith. Their faith at that point may not be necessarily where, what ours is. This is what I was thinking about when you were reading um, what you were reading. Jeremiah. You know, we're, we're living in a really interesting time. If As believers, if we really pay attention, um, Pulse mm -hmm. has changed Orlando. Yes. And if you ask me, it is set the church up to be able to win people to Christ mm -hmm. and leave the work mm -hmm. of changing the people to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well said. That's not our job. Mm -hmm. Our job, our call, our command is to love them. Mm -hmm. As a result mm -hmm. of Paul's, Orlando has a day of love. Mm. Have you ever heard that before <laughs> in the city? <laughs> no. Yeah. It's a day when the mayor and all of the elected officials, and all, they're saying, you know what? D to this set-aside day, we want it to be a day where we just put our differences aside and show love to one another. Mm -hmm. When you open the, the floodgates for that, you just open the door for God to be able to do his greatest work. That's right. Because as a believer, if I can put my, my feelings aside and I can really love on somebody, that's different than I am. Looks like Jesus. That doesn't, doesn't believe, and, and they know that I don't necessarily condone their life, but I can show them genuine love. Mm -hmm. Man, that's. You know what? Bishop Alan Wiggins is not only blessed to have you as his wife, but he better watch out because you're going to be up there <laughs> preaching. <girl. laughs> I know you do already, but that is so true and such a great, great insight for all of us today. You know, we're talking about living in exile. Yeah, we're in exile, but here it is, Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12. For Jesus, God, knows the plans that he has for us, plans yeah. to prosper mm -hmm. us and not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future regardless of where we are. But we better do our part, and we better be loving, and we better be all that Deborah Wiggins is talking about yeah. and all the other ladies. Yeah. Thank you, ladies, for being a part of this uh, wonderful panel and discussion today. Day. We've got more good stuff coming up for you viewers, so don't go away. Stay with us. Wow, I woke up on fire today. I don't know if it's the amazing coffee I drank this morning or the fact that I adore when God strips back one more layer of old wrong thinking patterns so that I can get stronger in my walk and share the advice with others. I just love when he guides my next step along the way and then waits for me to move on it. I've been reading Isaiah. I love the book of Isaiah. I have no idea how people can't just realize there's absolutely no doubt the resurrection took place because the prophetic words that were spoken about Jesus hundreds of years before he was even born were all fulfilled perfectly. It's simply the best history book ever written. God has had me studying Isaiah 54 for a few days. I've been experiencing fresh spiritual eyes and wisdom about things that I've read plenty of times. That's the beauty of the living and active Word of God. In Isaiah 54, 17, it says, No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication 
is from me, says the Lord. We've heard this so many times, right? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm the righteousness of Christ. We've heard these things and we speak them as everyday phrases as Christians. But do we truly ponder them in our hearts? Do we realize what God's trying to say to us? Do we have any idea the power in these truths? These promises are written for us. They're written so we know how to fight every spiritual battle. When God says their vindication is from me, he says something right before that. He says, every tongue that shall rise up against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Hello, we're the you God's talking to. We're the ones that have to tell the enemy who's throwing his flaming darts of condemnation our way that we aren't putting up with his nonsense anymore. We have to fight a little. We can hear a zillion times that we're more than conquerors, but sometimes the truth is we don't even want to conquer at all. We sit back, we worry, we get anxious, and we let the enemy control our thinking. Then we dwell on his lies long enough that he steals our joy at the very least. Then when we finally remember that we don't have to be anxious about anything and we decide to call on the word and the name of Jesus so the devil has to flee, after that, we begin to feel condemned. Come on, y'all. We let the devil throw his guilt bombs at us, at us after. Oh, you're still struggling with this. Wow, you really have a terrible mind. Nobody thinks like you. What a mess you are. Oh, the devil's so ugly. You see, in spiritual warfare, there's a premier attack we have to fight. We have to rebuke the enemy the second he throws any irrational thoughts, temptation, or fears our way. Then, after we've won the initial battle with the word, the name of Jesus, and prayer, we have to stand our ground. The Bible actually says, after you've done all that you can do to stand, stand firm then. We have to stand firm because there's usually a secondary attack of guilt the devil will try to throw at us after. We have to be prepared to extinguish all these flaming arrows of guilt from the enemy with our shield of faith. We have to stand on the truth in knowing this, the devil is not creative. You aren't alone. He tempts us all to sin. Everyone gets tempted in their thinking. We simply can't let the devil win by making us feel guilty every time we're tempted. Temptation isn't sin. Giving in to temptation is sin. We have to learn to rebuke the devil, put him back in his place, and continue to pursue holiness. We have to make a choice daily to choose God's thoughts and not the devil's. That's it. Let me tell you something, friends. The enemy has no authority even talking to you. Your blood-bought position as a believer guarantees your authority over him. His shots at you cannot penetrate your robe of righteousness. It's like the devil's shooting with blanks. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God told me to be real so you can heal. You're more than a conqueror, but you have to conquer. No more letting Satan think he's won. Fight him today with the word. Then their vindication's from me, says the Lord. I'm Mo Midlow with Unforsaken Women. For more on renewing your mind in the Word of God, join us at Unforsaken Women sometime or check out our website, unforsakenministries.com. Hope you enjoyed our program today. We talked about the church living in exile. What does that mean? Well, I looked up the in the dictionary the definition of exile, and it said separation from one's home or country, either voluntarily or by force of circumstances. Well, that made me think back to biblical times before Christ. The Jews were forced to live in exile at the hands of the Babylonians. They had no choice, but we have a choice here in America. No one so far has told us as Christians that we have to live 
live apart from society. There are no refugee camps that we have to go to, but in a way, maybe we as Christians should be living in exile. Perhaps we should separate ourselves from what society calls the norm. Just think back to what society in America looked like, let's say, a hundred years ago. Values were different. What was acceptable or not acceptable has changed dramatically. Today, there's more tolerance and even acceptance in our culture for alcohol use, divorce, contraception, homosexuality, abortion, gambling, pornography, even extramarital affairs. All of these topics were pretty much frowned upon in the 19th century. So who makes up the values? Who decides what is acceptable or to be tolerated? Is it the government? Is it the church? Is it the Bible? I mean, we have to have standards based on something. As Christians, the obvious answer to that is the Bible. But we live in a country where that will not necessarily be the value system. So what do we do? We live, figuratively speaking, in exile. We work hard to maintain our witness as our value system goes the way of the culture. It takes more work. It means really helping our kids and grandkids see our values as relevant and not old fashioned. It means prayerful, obedient living in a hostile world. But with God's help, we can do it. We can be ambassadors. We need to surround ourselves and our loved ones with godly people, mentors, and spiritual leaders. Simply put, we need to work harder and smarter. No one said the Christian life would be easy, or if they did, they were wrong. This life is fraught with challenges, difficulties, and problems. But take heart. Jesus is with us to the ends of the times. And that, my friends, is our note of hope for today. God bless you.